Well, this morning, uh, we continue through the New Testament. I trust your reading of the book of Acts is going, uh, going well. We're not preaching from Acts, but preaching parallel to that. Uh, last week, we started a series on unpacking evangelism, where we're looking at what the Scripture says about our personal evangelism. Now, you remember last week, uh, we, we ran through several passages or multiple commands through the New Testament um, that Jesus gave from when he called the disciples, told them they were to be fishers of men, Uh, explaining that the end would not come until the gospel had been preached to every nation, explaining that disciples are people who share. Uh, We looked specifically at Acts 1-8 and Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Acts 1-8, where he told them they'd receive power when the Holy Spirit came on them and be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the end of the earth. And then, of course, Matthew 28, 19 and 20, where they were given the great commission to go and make disciples of all the nations. And you remember we asked the question, were these commands just for the disciples then, or were they for us now as well? And, and we came to the conclusion that it's very, very clear from Scripture that these commands were given for all disciples, for every follower of Christ. Now, certainly, there's a little bit of fear and trepidation when we think about the role of, of sharing the gospel, but we were reminded last week that the power of the Holy Spirit enables us to fulfill our responsibility to fulfill the Great Commission. Well, what does the Spirit do? In the lives of of believers, those who know Christ, He's working in our lives, moving our heart, uh, developing compassion, developing burden, helping us to be open to and recognize opportunity, and then giving us the words to share. And then in the lives of those who are unbelievers, of those who don't know Christ, His role in their hearts and lives is to bring conviction, Um, to to begin to draw them to Christ, convict of sin and judgment, draw them to Christ, and create the desire um, to know more and and the enablement to be able to believe and receive Christ as Savior and Lord. So the Spirit is working on, the Holy Spirit is working on both sides of the evangelism equation, but it's not just the Spirit. We're a part of that process. Uh, His power is available, but we have to be the vessel or conduit for His power. So, we don't sit around and wait. Uh, We don't hope that he directs somebody to come by and ask some questions. Does that happen? Absolutely, but it's probably more rare. It's probably not as probable that your witnessing opportunities are going to come because somebody just walks up and, and asks you a question. In fact, most people typically are not even aware they have a spiritual need. They know that there's something missing. They know that there's something more in life, but they're not really aware that that's a spiritual need or that they need Christ. So we have to initiate. Uh, We are called as his followers to, to initiate, to direct the conversation, and to point out the need. We can't wait Um, for those who don't know Christ, to come to church. You know, it's interesting, Jesus said, first word of the Great Commission, go. What do we do? We come. Uh, We come to church, we come to worship service, we come to Bible study, we, we come to youth group, we come to different events. But those without Christ don't come. We can't sit and wait for them to come. We have to go and take the message of the gospel to them. That's our purpose and priority as believers. You know, in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, Paul talked about salvation. He said, by grace we're saved through faith, not a result of works that no one can boast. So he explains that how we're saved. We're saved by God's grace. We don't deserve it, and we place our faith in the work that Christ has done on the, on the cross. That's how we're saved. But then in Ephesians 2, 10, he goes on to say what happens after we're saved, why we're saved. What does he say? We are his workmanship, Christ's workmanship, God's workmanship. We are his workmanship, his creation, his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That's our life calling as believers. Once we've been saved, we're to do those good works that God has for us. What are those works? Bringing others to saving faith, bearing fruit. We can't opt out. It's plainly disobedient for us not to follow through what God has called us to do. You remember last week, we kind of finished with this thought. While we would say that Geyer Springs is a great church, we have to think about what we base that on. 
God says God's mark of a great church is a church that's 100% committed to doing what he's called us to do. That's getting the gospel to all nations. Well, a church is not 100% committed. A church is not an evangelistic church unless every member, every believer, every Christ follower, every disciple recognizes that they have the responsibility to be involved in evangelism. Now listen, this is not about heaping guilt on you in any way. I, I, I want you to think of it this way. One of the roles of a pastor is to be a coach. Well, if you've ever been involved in, in sports or ever even had a, a life coach to help you process life, sometimes a coach is going to ask you to do things that you maybe don't want to do. You think they're too hard. Or, or a coach is going to ask you to, to do some things, going to push you hard to do some things that you would not do on your own. And when you do those things, when you follow through what the coach is instructing you with and encouraging you to, um, typically when you do those things, you persevere, you become successful, and then you're very thankful that that coach pushed you to do those things. You're very thankful because you're not missing out because you followed through. So I hope you don't hear these words as words of guilt. I certainly would not do that. Um, but I would encourage you as I encourage myself. I struggle in this area just like every believer. There is some fear and trepidation. Not all of us have the gift of evangelism. It doesn't come uh, just naturally to us out of giftedness, but we're all called to share the faith. And so we want to walk through that and process through that together. Well, this morning, I thought it'd be good for us to look at an example of an evangelistic encounter. You know, there are lots of writings um, out there on, on uh, how to share your faith, on how to do personal evangelism, lots of different methods out there. Um, and, and many of those have some examples of people, even modern day people and what they've done. But you know, when you're gonna look for an example, for a real life example, you wanna learn from someone um, who does it right, who has the right technique, if you will. Well, the greatest evangelist of all time, of course, was our Lord. And there's several examples in Scripture of encounters he had with individual people, but we're going to take a few minutes this morning and look at one of those. And this is probably going to be a very familiar story to you. If you've got your copy of Scripture out, let me invite you to turn to John chapter 4. Um, there's really nothing new I'm going to tell you about the story. It's a very simple and, and straightforward story about Jesus evangelizing an outcast woman. In John 4, we have the account of Jesus who met the Samaritan woman at the well. And it's, it's a great model for us as we look at how Jesus approached this woman. It's a great model on how you approach an unbeliever and how you help them understand the gospel. Now, you may remember about a month ago, um, we covered the, the second half in John 4, the second half or the latter part of this encounter. Uh, we know that Jesus and the disciples were traveling from Judea to Galilee. He was going back to Galilee for more ministry. Now, to go from Judea to Galilee, there are three routes. There's an eastern route that, that crosses the Jordan River. There's a western route on the coast. And then there's a direct route up the middle from Judea to Galilee that goes right through Samaria. Now, the, the route that takes you through the heart of Samaria is the shortest route, but most Jews even though that route was shorter, most Jews would take one of the other two routes. Why? Because they didn't want to be anywhere around the, the Samaritans. Uh, they hated the Samaritans. The Samaritans uh, were Jewish people who had intermarried uh, when Assyria uh, conquered that part of the kingdom, and then they brought Babylonians in and resettled people. There was intermarriage. So the Samaritans were, were half-breeds. They had corrupted the Jewish race and corrupted the Jewish religion. So Jesus makes the decision, I'm sure the disciples weren't too happy with it, but he makes the decision that going from Judea to Galilee, they're going to go through Samaria. And in John 4, we see that they stopped on the outskirts of a town, Sychar. And the disciples uh, have gone into town to buy food. They've been traveling uh, all morning. It's around noon. They started out about six. The disciples have gone into town to buy food. And Jesus waits at a well um, outside of town. It was actually Jacob's well. And he waits here at that well. Now, I want you to read with me in John chapter 4, um, starting in verse 7. Let's just look at the conversation, the encounter Jesus had with this woman. John 4, verse 7. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. 
The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask me for a drink, a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered him saying, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right in saying I have no husband for you have had five husbands and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Now, four uh, quick pointers that, that I want to show you from Jesus' encounter with this woman. Four uh, simple things that are part of the process that we can apply as we seek um, to reach those who need to know Christ. And, and the first thing um, I want you to remember simply uh, by one word, and that's the word intersect intersect. Jesus intentionally put himself in a place where he would intersect this woman's life. Now, we started at verse 7. If you look back up at verse 4, it says very simply in verse 4, and he had to pass through Samaria. Now, in the Greek, uh, the, the phrase that he had to pass through Samaria, it literally means that it was necessary or it was required. Now, we, we could say, well, it was required because Jesus wanted to take the most direct route. It was required because Jesus was in a hurry and anxious to get to Galilee for the ministry there. But that's not the sense of, of what is said here. Actually, it was required or it was necessary for Jesus to go through Samaria because he had a divine appointment. I want you to think about this for just a moment. This is just kind of mind-boggling. Before this woman was even born, she had an appointment with the Lord. Before this woman was even born, there was an appointment set that they would meet at this well, and that appointment was going to lead to her salvation and consequently the salvation of many people who lived in her village. It was a divine appointment. That's why Jesus was there. You know, Jesus whole life, as you look at his life, his whole life was about intersection. Jesus sacrificed to intersect with sinful humanity. Think of Paul's words in Philippians 2 where he said that Jesus did not regard equality with God something to be held on to, but he willingly emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being found in appearance as a man. Why did he do that? Jesus came so that he could intersect with humanity. He, he was made in appearance as a man. He humbled himself even to the point of death on the cross. Why? Because he wanted to intersect with sinful humanity. That was Jesus' whole, whole purpose. Now he's putting himself in a place specifically to intersect with this woman. Verse 6 says that he was wearied from his journey. Again, in the Greek, wearied means to be at the point of, of sweat and exhaustion, to be worn out, to be spent. Now, think about it. Jesus had, um, they had been hiking, Jesus and the disciples, since dawn. They probably started out at, at 6 or maybe a little, even a little earlier than that. Uh, it's about 20 miles, this journey that they've made from dawn until noon. 
Um, it's not flat territory, it, it's hilly, so there'd be some exertion in that. Now it's noon, it's, it's the hot part of the day. He's thirsty, he's, he's tired, he's hungry. In our modern slang, we would say he's hangry. You know, when I'm hangry, I'm probably not going to have a very pleasant personality. I'm probably not going to be um, um, up for an intense conversation when I'm hangry. But Jesus has, again, made sacrifice to put himself in a place where he can intersect this woman. He, he's made sacrifice in coming. He is sacrificing in this instance so that he can bring the grace of God to this woman. Now, when you think about intersecting another person's life, intentionally putting yourself in a place to cross paths, there are people that we want to intersect, uh, people that we want to know, people that um, we, we think can benefit us, people that we would enjoy being around. But in this case, from a human perspective, this woman was not someone that any of us would choose to intersect. She had a horrible reputation in her town. She was known as an adulteress. She'd been with at least six different men. In fact, her, her reputation was so horrible. The reason this woman was coming to the well at noon, most women came early in the morning. It, it was a woman's job. The men would be out taking care of livestock, tending crops, doing whatever they do. It was a woman's job to get the water for the day. Most of the women in the town would come together either in the early morning or in the late evening when it was not so hot. But here this woman is coming in the heat of the day all by herself. In fact, she even has to pass a couple of other wells to get to this well. It's almost like she's getting as far away from the town as she can. Why? Because she's an outcast. She's the dregs of society. From a human perspective, this woman was not worthy of attention. She certainly wasn't worthy of the attention of the Lord God himself. But from a spiritual perspective, this is just the type of person that Jesus came for. And, and let me pause and say this. The reality is we, we all have sinned. None of us are worthy of the attention of the Lord. None of us are any less a sinner than this woman. No matter how minor we might think our sins are, we're all at the same point that this woman was. But Jesus frequently hung out with the outcast, didn't he? In fact, you know, as you look through Scripture and, and you see these people who are outcasts, these people who see themselves for what they are, typically they're more open Typically, they're, they're searching. They're, they're easier to intersect and befriend because they don't have many people who befriended them. They might be suspicious at first. You've maybe discovered that if you tried to befriend someone that was kind of on the outside. They might be suspicious at first of, of your intentions, but if you continue to pursue, they're usually pretty open. And so Jesus intersects the life of this woman, this outcast. He, he calls us to do the same. You know, I, I thought about this. One of the problems we have with intersecting people like this today, people who are, um, are, are, are sinful and moral and corrupt, one of the problems we have is, is we might resent them. I mean, we can look at people like this and say, you know, they're a big problem in our society. Look what they've done in our society. Look how they've drugged down our society. And we may even, in a very self-righteous attitude, we may even say, well, I, I don't want to be tainted by them. I mean, they're, they're filthy. In verse 9, you see that parenthetical statement where she, she asks him, well, why are you even asking me for a drink? And verse 9 has this statement, Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Now, the verb that, that is used there means this. Literally, you would translate that, Jews and Samaritans don't share the same utensils. We're not going to drink from the same cup. She points out, hey, you have, you have nothing to draw water from. I, I've got my, my vessel, but you're, you're not going to drink from my vessel. You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. We don't, we don't share the same utensils. And sometimes that's how we look at those who are apart from Christ, especially outcasts and people who in our minds are more sinful or more uh, immoral. It's almost like we see the immoral as the enemy and we forget that they're the mission field. We are supposed to abhor sin. We're supposed to hate sin, not the sinner. 
Jesus went after the very people that we often shy away from, and he made sure that his life was going to intersect with people just like this woman. Well, let me move very quickly through the next three steps because they're really pretty simple. The the second word besides intersect, the second word I would have you um, remember is the word initiate. As we said last week and reviewed earlier, our role is to go. That means if we're going to get the gospel message out, we can't sit back and wait. We have to take the initiative. What what did Jesus do? Well, first, he initiated um, some level of relationship with her. Now, they don't have a a long relationship that's been built over time, a a friendship that that has been around. It's it's just a few moments, but he, he gets to some level of relationship. How does he do that? He does that by asking her for help. He connects himself with her by asking for something, by asking for help, by by asking for a drink of water. He connects to her relationally. And then, obviously, he initiates conversation with her. And what I want you to see in his conversation is that he was patient and persistent. Listen, this woman is indifferent to the gospel message. She didn't come looking. And um, she's somewhat self-satisfied. She, she has religion. It's not appropriate. It's not proper. Her worship's not proper. And, and when you think about religion, religion is about men trying to make themselves right with God. That's why we say relationship with Christ is just that. It's relationship. It's not religion. We don't work. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. This woman has religion. She's jumping through the hoops thinking that'll make her right with God. But, but as you look at her life, you can see that she is still empty. She's thirsty. That's why she's been through all these different relationships with all these different men. So Jesus initiates a, a connection with her. He initiates a conversation with her. And then he, he identifies, he helps her see her need. He's offering her mercy and grace. She doesn't fully understand her need until he helps her identify what her need is. He's basically saying to her, listen, I can give you what you need. You're clearly thirsty. This physical water is not going to quench your thirst, but I can give you what you need. So he's intersected her and he's initiated uh, relationship. He's initiated conversation. He's helped identify her need. And then what does he do? He introduces himself. He introduces himself as Christ, or he introduces himself as Messiah, the one who can meet her need. And that's it. He intersects, he initiates the relationship conversation, he helps identify her need, and then he introduces the solution to her need. It's really a pretty simple process, but I'm not going to deceive you and say that it's easy. I will say it does get easier, and it does become more natural once you've begun this process in the lives of others and you've put yourself in a place to intersect and you've learned how to initiate and and look for relational cues and conversation, it it does get easier. And the process is very simple, but for most of us, until we jump out there and jump in the deep end, so to speak, um, it's going to feel awkward and, and somewhat unnatural. Well, it starts with what? It starts with intersecting a life. It's a conscious decision to put yourself in a place, to put yourself in the way of someone else where your lives intersect. And I'll be honest, that requires some sacrifice. You know, for some of us, it may be giving up some time we spend doing a hobby, or it may be giving up uh, watching a, a game or sporting event on television or, or watching some reality show. Listen, that bachelor and bachelorette stuff, that's junk. You don't need to be watching that anyway. But you may have to sacrifice some of your own personal time. Uh, women, you may have to sacrifice lunch with the girlfriends or, or shopping with the girlfriends. But you've got to find ways to, to take some time and set aside some time and put yourself out there. You know, as, as the weather's getting warmer and as people are, are outside and, and as social distancing becomes not as big an issue, maybe it's foregoing a, a project on, in your own yard or house and going over and, and helping a neighbor. But just putting yourself in places where you intersect with people, where they literally stumble over you. And then from there, uh, initiating with them. You know, one of the greatest ways to initiate with this woman, Jesus found a commonality. They, they both were looking for water. One of the greatest ways to initiate relationship is to ask for help. 
to ask a neighbor, hey, I've noticed, maybe ask the, the lady next door, I've noticed, man, your rose bushes are beautiful. Can you, can you come over and, and show me what I'm not doing right or what I need to do? Or, or maybe it's asking, you see him working in his garage on a project. Hey, do you know how to build this or repair this? But it's just relationally putting yourself out there and making that connection. And then, of course, the, the conversation. That's probably the harder part for most of us, bringing the gospel into the conversation. Listen, if you're really praying and you're really counting on the Holy Spirit and you're tuned in, you're going to see opportunities to come up to just make an initial comment, to plant an initial seed, a, a thought, where eventually a good gospel conversation comes out of that. Like Jesus, we, we have to be patient and we have to be persistent. Again, sometimes people don't realize um, the spiritual need that they have, but in time as we have that relationship we've initiated, and as we start talking about the gospel, um, we have opportunity to help them see, well, the reason you feel lonely or the reason you feel like you don't have a sense of purpose or the reason you're fearful, the reason you don't have any hope, and, and we have an opportunity to bring the gospel conversation in because we've initiated that relationship and that communication, and then we're identifying, we're helping them see their need. You know, one of the greatest ways to help people see their need and their shortcoming uh, when I was in seminary, one of my counseling classes, the textbook was called Integrity Therapy, and the, the professor who wrote the book was actually teaching the class, and he said, if you want to get someone to open up about their shortcomings or their failings, the best way to do that is open up about yours first. You know, when we tell people about needs that we've had and how Christ has met them, when we're open about our needs and our failings and our shortcomings, it makes them much more comfortable being open with us. And so then we, we've, we put ourselves uh, in their path, we've intersected them, we've initiated relationship and conversation, we've helped identify their need, and then what do we do? We introduce them to Christ. We tell them how Christ has met our needs and how Christ can meet their needs. It's a pretty simple process. The biggest step for us is just getting started. Recognizing our calling as followers of Christ to take the gospel to all the world, starting next door, starting in the next cubicle, starting in the desk next to us at school, starting with the house next door. And for that to happen, we got to put ourselves out there. It starts with that commitment to intersect, to put ourselves in the middle of other people's lives. Would you bow and pray with me this morning? And, and I know you're sitting there in your home, in your living room, you're comfortable, maybe other families around, but would you just bow your head and close your eyes where you can just simply um, not have any distraction, but the next moment or two just between you and the Lord. Maybe over the last couple of weeks, last week and this week, you're beginning to get that sense of burden that the Lord wants you to have and beginning to recognize you've got to, clear calling on your life as a follower of Christ. Maybe you would take a moment right now and just say, Lord, I, I hear you. I understand from your word that I have a responsibility to communicate the gospel to those that you've brought into my life. You know, maybe today the, the biggest step, and, and this is why I spent the most time on it, the biggest step is just making a commitment to intersect the lives of other people, to put yourself in a place where you're encountering others. Now, obviously, that needs to be true of, of neighbors you live around, of coworkers when you're back in school, of, of classmates, but, but even some intersection with those you may see on occasion at a gas station, at Starbucks, at the grocery store, at your favorite restaurant just to be continually practicing and looking for ways to intersect lives and speak the truth of the gospel. You know, you may be listening this morning, you may be tuning in this morning, and you don't yet have a relationship with Christ. He came solely for the purpose of intersecting with sinful humanity and paying the price for our sin so that we can have a relationship with him and a home in heaven. And I want to challenge you this morning, if you're hearing this message and you don't have a relationship with Christ, would you, would you contact us? We're not going to force any decision on you. We just want to help you understand what Christ has done for you and how you should respond to him. 
bottom line is this, as, as we say every week, what has God said? We, we've heard from his word. They're not my words, they're his words. We've heard from his word. And he calls for a response. What's he said? What do you need to do? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for truth that is very clear. Father, thank you that we don't have to wonder what you want us to do or how we're to go about it. It's very clear from the scripture. And Father, I pray today for all of us, me included, who've looked into your word this morning, that we would be responsive to what you have said to us individually. Father, help us to obey as your followers, as your servants. For we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.